Yeah, this talk then, it's an introduction to a wide variety of field signs. I should say, first of all, can you see the picture? Can you all see the... Um... Yeah, we can all see it, Ben. You can see it, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, so looking at the field signs that allow us to detect um, the presence of microlepidoptera and to identify the species that are responsible. Um, I'll try and cover a wide variety of species, types of signs and the many different feeding methods used. Um, I'll try to illustrate this with things that you might find around now. As I say, most of these will be things that I found up in, you know, up, up in my area, but I'm pretty sure they'll almost all be um, around down your way also. Um, and I'll say one or two of the photos I think were taken um, around sort of Gloucestershire, possibly down into Somerset. Um, and hopefully if anyone's inspired, you'll be able to go out into the field tomorrow, weather permitting, well, it doesn't matter, whatever the weather, that's one of the beauties of it, and record um, some of these field signs without too much trouble. Okay, so, um, well, I could say what are micromoths, I'm sure you all know really, um, but there's about one and a half thousand of them, and they're the groups of moths, not necessarily the smaller ones, but um, there's the odd one that's quite large, like the moth there in the bottom left-hand corner, which is the box moth. Um, that's a crambid and it's got a um, four centimeter wingspan. So it's pretty big, not particularly micro. But then in the top right-hand corner, we've got something called Phylonerycta streculatella, which is um, a leaf mining moth um, associated with gray alder. Um, and the wingspan of that will only be about seven millimeters. So there's quite a discrepancy in size, and of course some are even smaller than that. Now, these micromoths here, th uh, three of these, probably all of them except the Phylonerycta, were pretty well attracted to light, and I guess most of, most of you will have had the other three, I would, have, I would imagine, anyway, to light traps. Um, so we've got Terophorus pentadactyla, the, the white plume moth in the top left-hand corner, and in the bottom right we've got Elusta hexadactyla, which is, uh, what is it these days, many plumed moth or 20 plume moth. It's been known as variously um, associated with honeysuckle. The Phylonerycta, on the other hand, is not really particularly attracted to light. There's a few species that may turn up in a trap from that genus, but they're often a bit mangled and battered by the time they get there and obviously present identification difficulties. No such problem if you head out into the field and look for the field signs. Um, okay, so well, then what are field signs? And these can vary. Um, right in the middle of that page, we've got what's obviously a leaf mine, which means that there's a larva feeding actually within the leaf between the lower and the upper epidermis. Um, and so you can see the larva and you can see a frass pattern and usually the colour and the nature of the mine will in many cases allow you to identify it down to species level. Um, the others show larvae feeding within stems, forming galls, feeding within fruit, creating cases, spinning leaves, feeding in catkins, feeding in a case underwater, and um, overwintering in a cocoon. The bottom right um, is a... Uh, Sorry, I've gone blank. Um, Pameni regiana, um, where the larva forms a cocoon behind the flaky bark of sycamore trees. Um, there's some of some of the things that you can find. Okay. Now, as I said, some micromoths are attracted to light, but others are hard to record in this way because they don't travel far from the specialised habitats. Some are not particularly well attracted to light anyway, and there are some as well that, that can't fly. There's some female moths that are apterous, meaning they, they have no wings or no functioning wings. Um, so, well, why record micromoth field signs? Certainly allows us to record far greater number of species than just sitting waiting, hopefully, for moths to enter the trap, particularly at this time of year. I mean, if you go out looking for field signs, I'm sure down in Gloucestershire, you can easily get, you know, and a species count of 30, 40 species. Um, it'll take a long time to get those turning up in the trap. 
But also finding the feeds, feeding signs means that the larva is present and therefore you're proving that breeding has taken place at a particular location and you know arguably it's then far more valuable than a record of a moth that's been attracted into your garden. I think it gives us a greater understanding of the biology of a species but hopefully it's enjoyable in itself. Um, it allows you to go out in all habitats um, at any time of year it's peaceful, it's relaxing, and you can go very slowly. Um, and, you know, if you cover 10 yards, 10 yards in half an hour, you can be doing well. Um, and provides opportunities for photography as well. Um, so, okay. The methods that are on this slide, um, of looking at various species that feed within um, twigs and stems, um, and there's loads of, loads of species. I've just picked out some examples that on the whole are not too obscure and, and can be looked for. And I would imagine will occur in your area as, as they do in mine. And the examples here we've got are Glyphytrix simpliciella, the coxfoot moth. I presume that's a very common moth in Gloucestershire, um, certainly is in Lancashire and Cheshire. Um, and the larvae, the tiny little green larvae, about three to four millimetres in length, over winter within papery cocoons in the center of dried stems of coxfoot grass, which is the, the tall grass that grows in clumps. The um, stems can be a meter or so high. And if you look carefully, you'll see these tiny little holes in there. Um, and they're exit holes to allow the moth to emerge in May and June. If you find these holes and then open the stem a good distance away from, from the holes and just gradually peel off bits of the stem, you will see the larvae within. Alternatively, just pick a few of these stems, stick them in a tub and wait for May, June or earlier if you've kept it inside to arrive in, and the moth will just appear within the tub. And um, you, know, you can see certainly good for opportunities for photography and it'll allow you to go to an area out of the normal flight season and record the presence of that moth. You know, if you went out into the field in January, and I just expect they're looking for adults, you're not going to find the moth of Glyphytrix simpliciella, but it's very, very easy to find in the early stages, which, which prove its presence. Um, in the middle is um, a blackish mine that, that's formed on broom twigs. Um, can't actually see it very well, so you'll have to take my word for it. At the top end of that, there's a shiny black egg. Um, and that proves the presence of a Neptuculid moth called Trifercula imundella. A pretty much identical mine is made by the next species, Leucoptera spartifoliella. The main difference being that that egg is not present. And later in its life cycle, the larva leaves the mine and forms that white um, cocoon um, along the branches of the um, of broom. Um, and that, that's something that only Leucoptera spartifoliella makes. Um, you, you probably you won't see the cocoons until spring, but um, you will be able to record the mines. Other examples, there's plenty of species that actually feed within the stems, um, and a lot of them do so in autumn and actually during winter. They just overwinter, waiting for winter to end, pupate in the spring and then emerge later on. And examples are Epiblema scutulana larva, which feed in the stems of creeping thistle um, and, and other thistles. Um, Mylo circum, circumvillata, the um, thistle ermine, which feeds in stems of spear thistle and uh, also creeping thistle. And then on the right, we've got, um, yeah, on the right, we've got two larvae of actually of different species both of which feeding in um, ragwort stems. Um, the one that's higher up, the smaller one, is, is Cacaelis atricapitana. Actually, that, that's not actually its name anymore, is it? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head what its new name is. Something much longer and even more difficult to say. And the one at the bottom is Epiblema costipunctana. Um, both feed in ragworts. Costipunctana tends to be down in the roots or just above the roots, but also leaves you know, leaves the stem um, in late autumn. So you won't find that presence at the moment. On the other hand, you will find Atricapitana, which stays within the stem over winter um, until the emergence of the adults in spring. 
um, those previous species, there's not always any obvious external evidence. You may, you may get a hole later on in the development in the stem, um, which is formed by the larva, obviously to allow the moth to exit once it emerges. Other species are much more obvious because a gall is, found, is formed, causing the, the stem to swell um, around the larval um, tenancy. And again, a, a nice neat hole is excavated by the larva to allow the adults to emerge. Um, and these all show um, the hemp agrimony plume, Adena microdactyla. Um, the galls are formed in the stem of hemp agrimony. Uh, and the exit hole allows for us expulsion and yeah, the adult to emerge. And that's a nice one to look for over winter. Uh, it's got a couple of generations. The photo at the top shows um, feeding signs um, in late summer when the plant's nice and fresh. Down at the bottom was a photo taken in, in January. Um, so as long as the plant's still standing, you can very easily um, document it, um, the, you know, document the presence of the larva by those feeding signs. There's nothing else that's going to be doing that. Um, lots of other species form gall. A few of the moth species do. Um, in great willow herb, um, towards the tips of the um, flowering stems, you'll see galls again with a hole in, formed by Mumford Bradleyi. Um, similarly, in broadleaf willow herbs, you can get um, galls formed by Mumford divisella, very similar species. Uh, this is actually one from, from down your way. I think it may be considered a, across the border in Somerset from, it's Lee Woods anyway, that was where I photographed that. And the photo below is the adult that emerged. Um, Mumford sterni pinella forms galls in Rose Bay willow herb stems. And the photo there, well, those two photos in the center are both that species. And the one on the left was a photo taken in early February, showing five galls from the previous season in a stem of Rose Bay Willow Herb. And there on the right is um, Cygia servilana, a tall trix moth, um, whose larva feed within the stems of um, sallow and young sallow twigs um, and overwinter within. What else do we got? Okay, so other species will feed in fruits and seed pods. Now, actually, we, we have you won't find any of these at this time of year. They're, these are all species that will have been feeding in autumn, and the larva will now be somewhere down in the soil or the leaf litter in a cocoon waiting to um, pupate um, at the end of winter and then emerge in spring. So we've got Graphalita funibrana um, in this is in a slow um, not much external evidence of its presence, really. But if it, to look for it, you've kind of got to put your hands on the slows and just give them a little squeeze. And the ones that have um, attended, all of, most of the slow will have been eaten and replaced by frass. So it just feels a lot softer. You may have um, an exit hole ev evident, but not always. Um, the one in the middle is the larva of Pimeni fasciana um, in an acorn. And down at the bottom, the codling moth, Cydia pominella in, in apple. Um, and that, there's obvious holes within the apple. And if you open it up, you'll find quite destructive feeding signs, plus a reasonably distinctive larva. Um, in seed pods, you can get things like Raphaelita lunulana in veg pods, and Mumphus abistragella in broad-leafed willow herb pods, and other, other small willow herbs as well. And it causes the seed pod to curve around in that really distinctive manner that you can see there on the right hand side. That can striped larva um, can be seen if you open the pod up um, and it'll be in there chewing away on all the, all the fresh seeds. Catkins at this time of year can be a good source of larvae. One example is Argyrestia goidartella, which feeds within birch catkins. Um, very close relation, Argyrestia brochiella also feeds within birch and alder catkins. They, they both feed in birch or alder. Um, it's said that with Goidartella, the hole is formed in the side of the catkin. Um, so an exit hole that allows frass to be expelled. For brochiella, the hole is said to be in the tip of the catkin. That does seem about right from, from my experience, but you know, if I'd, I'd be interested to hear if anybody's experienced anything different. Um, 
And then other feeding signs. Well, again, this isn't something you can particularly look for at this time of year because this relies on finding flower heads and seed heads. And most of these will have gone over now. And um, certainly this is a case in point. But in the flower heads of ragwort, um, ones with tufts of seeds with um, obviously disrupted flower heads, maybe with a little bit of frass or silk evidence. And uh, every species that will cause that, but this is a fairly distinctive larva that you can hope to see in the heads of ragwort. It will, it will feed in other related plants such as yarrow as well and tansy. Um, that's yes, yeah, quite a distinctive larva with the pinkish um, dorsal and subdorsal stripes and the uh, black line at the back end of the prothoracic plate. The prothoracic plate is, is, is the hard area just behind the head. Um, and often that has, that's got distinctive markings on which can help you identify a particular larva. Um, other signs you can find in seed heads. This may still be evident at this time of year, actually, but it's probably easy when the plant's fresh. Um, and this is a Galeckiid moth called Tochiusa porpella, or possibly something else. Uh, anyway, it it's, feeds on flea bane, and the larva can be detected by looking for these raised florets, which you can see there. And these are in the center of the flower. And if you pull those little florets out, you'll find the larva underneath with frass and evidence of feeding. If you pick a couple of those flower heads, um, and look after them, stop them going mouldy, then you can get one of these beautiful moths to emerge. And this is probably a species that is very unlikely to turn up, at, you know, in your garden trap. Um, so it's, it's certainly a nice one to, to read through. Um, another moth that you can, or another larva that you can find in flower heads. So this is one that you certainly can find over winter in carline thistle. Um, and this is probably more of a southern speciality. These photos were taken in Dorset. Um, it's quite subtle feeding signs, but there is slight disruption of the um, flower head in the center with slightly raised flor florets. I'm not sure the photo demonstrates that all that well. Um, but again, if you sort of examine a bit closely, you can see that the larva is, is, in, is in there um, feeding just beneath the seed head. Um, the larva that's photographed there is typical of the Met Metzneriella um, genus. Metzneriella estivella um, is, is one that's just associated with carline thistle, but there's other members of the same genus that are associated with knapweed um, or with burdock. Um, and so, you know, you need to you need to know the plants as well. You need to have a good idea of. Uh, the name of the plants and then it makes it does make it so much easier to identify the species responsible. Um, so, uh, a very common sign when we're looking for field signs is to look for larval spinnings of leaves, obviously far more prevalent in spring, summer and autumn than they are in winter. Most of the spinnings that you see in winter will be our friend the light brown apple moth Epiphias postvitana and I'd certainly say that any spinning with a green larva in at this time of year is that unless proven otherwise. And it almost certainly will be that. I suppose other alternatives are Detula angustiana, um, maybe the carnation tortrix as well. Um, but anyway, th this, this particular species is, is one that you might find in late spring, early summer. Um, and the campus is popular. And this uses sallows, willows, poplars. And on these larger leaved plants, it rolls the leaf from side to side. It does something slightly different on creeping willow, but on, on, um, on something like grey willow, yeah, it ro rolls it from, from side to side, obvious silk present there. So that you know that something, some, something has hidden itself away and doesn't want to be seen. If you were to carefully unroll that leaf, you will, almost certainly find the larva of Anacampsis populella. Um, I sometimes people are a little bit worried about opening them up because they think it's going to disturb the larva's development. But 
I find that pretty rarely to be the case. I mean, if you keep opening it up and making it roll the same leaf many, many times, then it's probably wasting energy that could otherwise, you know, be put to good use. And that probably does have a harmful effect on its development. But I think opening it at least once to get a photo and to examine the larva is, is, is reasonable um, and will allow you to identify it. Um, similar species on birch, and um, there is, I'll just go back to Anacampus popularly. Yeah, there's, there's a related species on birch called Anacampsis blattariella, which forms pretty much identical spinning, just, just it happens to be on birch. Again, it goes from side to side. The problem with birch is there's also a tortrix moth, Epinosia salandriana, that does pretty much the same. And it'd be pretty hard pushed to separate the two spinnings from appearance alone. Um, so it's another one where you'd need to have a good look at the larva. Ideally, try and rear it through. I mean, if you get the adult, there's absolutely no um, doubt about the identity. Um, another spinning that you can find on birch is one is, is from the larva of Epinosia brunichana, and that's the one on the right hand side. And rather than rolling the birch leaf from side to side, this one actually rolls it from the tip to the base. It forms quite a tight spinning with the sides neatly tucked in. Um, and that's that's pretty distinctive as well. Um, so, but again, the, most of these are, you know, ideally, it's great to rear them through. Nobody can argue with you about the identity then. Um, other species form webs, some of which are obvious, some less so. Um, species on the top left, Swamidamia caseella, um, forms a web on the top of birch leaves, and that's the adult just below it. And then those photo on the right show um, one of the small ermine moths, in this case, the bird cherry ermine, Hipponymuta, Hipponymella. And this can form some really impressive um, webs. This was on a tree here in Manchester, um, a bird cherry tree. And the web it covered every, every centimetre of the tree. Um, from the tips of the branches right down to the base. And it, and it was just, this is, as you can probably tell from the photo, this is just a tree growing on a, a grass verge in a suburban street in Manchester. And the web went all the way along the verge and started on um, the uh, leaves of a nearby, on, sorry, on the tires of a nearby park car. I was just desperate to find more uh, foliage really to uh, chomp away on um because the the larvae had unfortunately run out of tree um but that, that's a bit of an exception the webs are usually not quite so extensive as that um okay so one great field sign to look for is leaf mines um and as i mentioned earlier leaf mines are where a larva actually feeds within the leaf it's not made it's not that it's made of spinning it's actually inside the leaf itself and it's feeding between the lower and the upper epidermis. And the way it feeds, often coupled with the appearance of the larva and the food plant that's been chosen, will very often allow us to identify the species responsible. Um, and I think these three are all ones that you can safely identify from, from, the, from the leaf mine. And at least two of these you can find now. So the one on the left, Ectodemia herringella, um, yeah, I think that photo was taken in Bristol, Bristol Town Centre. You, you've got loads of home oak in Bristol, far more than we have up here. Um, and it's covered with this species. Um, and there's nothing else really that's going to be mining it at this time of year. Um, you do have, th there is another species, Stigmella subarivora, that makes larger gallery mines. Um, but I don't think the larva would be present at this time of year. And the mine itself is much bigger. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So the, all, all the mines that are pictured here are what we describe as gallery mines. And that means there's an obvious start, there's an obvious end, and there's a path in between. And you can tell where the larva has been because it's eaten away um, leaf tissue and it's left behind um, a trail of droppings. And that trail of droppings is it we call frass um, and sometimes that can be really quite a artistic um, artistic trail um, particularly the one in the middle which is something called stigmella nylandriella 
Um, and this is a species that feeds on rowan. It's uh, a nice bright green larva, feeds in June, July, and it leaves this quite wide gallery, but quite a tortuous one, often following the edges of the leaf with um, these arc shapes. And that's, that really is one of my favorite, favorite leaf mines. The moth below is nothing in comparison. Um, the photo on the right is one of the commonest leaf miners. You're never far from a leaf tenanted by Stigmella aurella. Um, so this feeds on um, bramble, um, yeah, raspberry, um, other related species, but certainly on bramble, it's, it's extremely common. Um, there's one or two other um, nepticulid mines that feed on bramble, but if it's a gallery mine with a relatively thick line of frass, at least in parts, then it's gonna be Stigmella aurella. Um, the moth itself, if you get a good look at it, is quite an attractive thing with an orange head, um, a gold sort of um, base of the wings, and then purple, yeah, with the, with the, with the white fascia across. Um, but you'd never, you'd hardly ever see one in the field. Um, and if you were, were to net one when you're out, you'd really struggle to identify it. So another one, if you really want to see the adults, it's much better to try and um, rear one of these. They're not, not difficult to do. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, so yeah, they, they're all gallery miners. You can see there's an obvious trail that's been left by the larva. Others are blotch miners. Actually, some of these are, uh, combine a gallery and a blotch. The one on the left is Ectodemia submaculella, which, which would have been feeding probably in so October, November and that forms big blotches on oak. It, it's very distinctive because it also forms a slit on the underside of the leaf, which allows for us to be expelled. Um, there is a very small gallery right at the start of the mine, but it's usually subsumed by the following blotch. The photo in the middle is of another um, member of the Nepticulid family of Micromoths. This is Stigmella plagicolella, which feeds on prunus species, in particular blackthorn. And as you can hopefully just about see from the photo, it does form an initial gallery, and then it leads to a big whitish blotch, a little bit like a tadpole, if you use your imagination. Um, and then on the right is, a, is another common species found on bramble that you can find this time of year. Actually, you can find it all year round. Coptetrecha marginia. Um, and... Uh, yeah, it forms, well, I've heard them described as funnel-shaped mines. Again, you have to use your imagination. Um, it's basically narrow at one end and wider at the other, and they are essentially blotch mines. And if you hold those mines up to the light, you will probably see, you should see it at this time of year, you should see a lava within them. Um, obviously, if the mine itself is, is brown and flaky and the leaf is old, then it may be that the lava's long gone and um, what you're seeing is evidence of mining from the previous year. But if you look carefully, you should find some fresh mines of those at this time of year. Um, sometimes there's a number of, um, well, there's a number of species where there'll be multiple occupancy of a leaf. Um, and these are some, I think, some good examples of that. On the left, there's a leaf of bilberry now. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with bilberry, but the leaves themselves are really small, um, you know, probably no more than a centimetre or two in length. But this one had 15 larvae feeding on it, larvae of Incavaria olmaniana. Right. Um, so, yeah, that that's, uh, was, was a great one to find. I, that's not, not one I'd ever found. Yeah, I didn't think that was right. It's old Maniella, apologies. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I'd not found the early stage to this one before, so I was really quite excited to find these bilberry leaves um, tenanted by the, by the larva of this species. Um, it only stays within the leaf mine during the first instar. Then it cuts itself a little piece of bilberry leaf um, to form a case and then feeds from within this case on neighbouring bilberry leaves and on the leaf litter and overwinters in that form. Carries on eating on, on milder days, um, refreshing the case as it goes along by cutting a bigger um, circle of uh, leaf and, um, 
and then pupates around sort of April, May, with the adults emerging the following month. The one in the middle is um, Hawthorn moth, Scythropia crategella, which may be sort of well known from, it, it's, it for, forms webs on Hawthorn, but the very early stages is as a leaf miner. And here you can see a leaf again tenanted by multiple larvae. I think there were, I think there were fourteen in this one, um, something like that. Anyway, um, and then on the right we've got a, a Crocosops brungniardella, which is a common miner really on oak. Um, it's quite an impressive moth. Again, not one that's likely to turn up in your moth trap. So well worth trying to rear through. Very, very easy. One of the probably one of the very easiest to rear through. Um, the larvae, um, usually there's a number of them in a single leaf. Um, and they start out with these silvery gallery mines. And then these gradually coalesce into a single inflated blotch mine, which is a silvery white colour. And again, if you hold it up to the light, you'll see three, four, five larvae feeding in there. Um, when I've read these, I've, I've took the leaf and that, after a few days, the larvae leave the leaf, form a cocoon on the top of the pots that you've got it in. And um, about, it was really short, it was about nine or 10 days later, the moths emerged. And I think it's quite a spectacular species. This bright red eyes and it's, up, it's curved palps and it's, it's well worth doing. Um, what else? The mother leaf mine. So um, the one on the left is a Galechiid moth, Cressoestia drurella, which forms these gut like galleries um, uh, on, uh, well, this one's on the Chenopodium species. Um, so on Atriplex, Sorash type things as well. Um, and so you can find this on sort of wasteland and uh, brownfield sites. But I've also seen this, um, you know, okay, will grow on, I think it, it, I've, I've, yeah, I'm sure I've seen the minds of this um, growing in the Avon Gorge as well um, on the Leewood side, because um, you've got plenty of um, a rash growing down there. Um, in the centre is another blotch mine, and this is one formed by a moth from the uh, Phylonerichter genus. There's about 60 or so of these moths the Phylonerichter species in, in this country. And these are, these are great ones to try and rear through because they're really, they're really not that difficult. And the adults themselves are quite spectacular. I mean, they're only small. They'll be, you know, about four millimeters at most in length, but um, the markings are often very distinctive, um, particularly when the moth's fresh. Again, it's one where if it turns up in your trap, it can be a bit hard to identify it. The uh, two examples there, though, having said that, are quite distinctive. The one in the middle is Phylonerichter arboris, um, the larva of which forms a large, uncreased mine on the underside of oak leaves. And the one on the right, Phylonerichter trifasciella, um, it forms twisted mines on honeysuckle. It's one that you can find very early in the year. I mean, I have a feeling that photo was taken from late February, and this was in Lancashire, so... It's, it's, it's worth looking out for, um, probably a bit early just yet, but it won't surprise me if in a month or so you'll you'll start to see these appearing. Um, and then they can appear really throughout the year. Um, and some leaf mines are in sort of le less obvious leaves, things that we maybe don't immediately think of when we're, you know, if we're sort of contemplating what sort of leaf would we see the larva in. Um, the one on the left is something feeding in a, pine needle, and this is Sedestis subfasciella. There's probably about 10 or more different species whose larvae feed within pine needles. Um, they're not that hard to find, but they are pretty difficult to identify. So until you've reared a few, I, I would recommend trying to rear them to try and separate the species. Um, the one in the middle is another of the pine needle feeding species, Exotelia dodicella. So obvious differences between these two is obviously the one on the left is a green larva. The one in the right is, is a sort of reddish brown color. And also the, the larva on the left, all the frass remains within the um, needle as, as the larva mines from the tip down to the base. With the um, Exotelia dodicella in the center, as you can see, there's a little hole up near the top and it expels most of the frass through that. 
Um, so they're, they're two that I, I think it is reasonably okay to identify. Certainly once you've had a, a you know, maybe some experience with these, but these are ones that you can identify from the um, appearance of the mine. And on the right is an example of the Elechis today. Um, it's a family of about 50 or so species, um, other than two or three of them. These all mine various, well, gray, um, sorry, blades of grass, sedge or rushes. Um, and in this case, this is one that mines the leaves of glaucus sedge. Don't, I don't know whether you get this down in Gloucestershire, um, this species, Elechista scenario punctella. But it's a nice one because the mine itself is reasonably distinctive and the lava even more so. Um, the, the mine runs from tip to base, usually just down one half of the um, blade of um, sedge. And uh, the lava is sort of creamy coloured with these uh, really distinctive pinkish red spots all along the thorax and abdomen. Um, I don't think there's anything else that could be mistaken for. Whereas if the moth itself turned up in your moth trap, well, it'd probably need dissecting, wouldn't it? If you're really stuck, you can have a good look in the leaf litter and find plenty of interesting things. And one of the most interesting is um, one of the case-bearing larvae of the family Adelidae. Day. Now, there's, there's a few species that may turn up. Um, and also, well, one of the commonest is this one, um, Nemophora, Nemophora digiriella, um, which forms a case from arranging circular pieces of cut out sections of leaf and spinning them together. And um, it sits within this case, just poking its head out to gnaw away on, um, on the leaf litter. And it does this over winter, develops. And then in, in late spring, the adult will emerge. This is obviously really a fantastic micro moth. And you pro I imagine most of you will be reasonably familiar with this. It does sometimes turn up in moth traps, but the best way to see it is on a, you know, on a nice sunny afternoon and you can see swarms of these flying around with the long antennae twirling. Um, and they're, they're great. Um, but uh, I, was, I was so impressed with the larva that that was, that was the cover star of Micromoth Field Tips Volume 2. Um, other things you might find in leaf litter, what well, you can find, you can find mines, and a lot of those mines will still have the larva in, and they'll overwinter in there. The one on the left was um, a species called Tisharia echobladella, which forms mines on, egg, on, on oak. But I think they look a little bit like fried eggs, because they have a, a circular... Um, area in the center, which is where the larva overwinters, and a pale area of the leaf around it, which is the, the part of the leaf that the larva has been feeding. And the larva spends its winter in there and emerges as a moth directly from the leaf in around May or June. On the right is a species that, well, we've, we've missed the boat probably for this one this year, but it's a good one to look for in November, even into December. If you're anywhere near Aspen, you can see these fallen leaves with obvious green islands. And if you look right down at the base of that island, you can see some a larva in there that's, that's feeding away. And it's the larva mining that causes the leaf to turn green. Complicated process involving bacteria. Um, but that, that particular example is Ectodemia argyropisa. And if you find these signs in fallen aspen leaves, then that's what it is. There's nothing else that's going to do that. Okay. Other leaves get folded into where well, you, you can have leaf folds and then cones. Um, and again, the type of the plant that you found it on will usually determine the species of moth. And this is a really good example because there's nothing else that's going to do this on the St. John's wart species. This is Euspilapteryx or Ugotella. Um, and you can find these feeding signs in, in summer and again in late autumn. Um, and it's quite a spectacular moth, but I've never had it in the in the moth trap. I mean, I, it does it does come to light. I don't think particularly strongly, um, but I've never had it in the moth trap. But I've found it in the field quite a few times. Um, so sort of touched upon this. Some other species will form cases, usually by um, spinning an amount of silk into a case, often incorporating. Um, plant materials 
um, frass, sometimes even dead insects. Um, there's a couple of families that whose larvae, you know, always use this technique. But there's, there are a few examples from other families too, and, and here's some of those. Um, Coleophora argentula, well, that's an example of the Coleophoridae family. There's about 100 species in this country. And they, they basically, they all, they all form um, <clears throat> cases, at least for part of the larval stage. Um, and there's another one where the, you know, the appearance of the case, the plant that it's on, the type, the year you find it, sorry, the time of year that you find it, will all help you to identify that species. By and large, if that adult was to turn up in your moth trap, uh, I don't think your record, your county recorder would allow that as a record without having it dissected, first of all. But I'm sure they'd be perfectly happy with your record of Coleophora argentula on yarrow, which forms these tubular cases and can be found often in good numbers in, you know, dead yarrow seed heads at this time of year. In the middle is uh, a moth from a different family entirely. This is from the Galecchia day, and it's Thyotrica subocellia, whose larvae feed on marjoram and form a case, as you can see from a florid of, of marjoram itself. Um, did manage to find this one, but uh, it may also be found by sort of gentle tapping of the flower heads or, or just by taking if taking a few flowers at random and hoping that something, put, pop, putting them in the pot and hoping that something will crawl up the side of the pot, revealing the presence of the case. Um, and then on the right is an example of the Psychidae family, and probably the best known member, something called Psychicaster that forms this really quite distinctive case from old um, pieces of grass stem. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the, so the top is one of the cases that this was positioned on a rock um, and just trying to think. Yeah, it was still in, but this was fixed, ready to pupate. Um, obviously, the one below shows the lava, with its head protruding from the case. And then the two photos below, well, the upper photo shows the male with its fantastic feathered antennae. And at the bottom is female moth so that's one that's certainly never going to reach your trap because it doesn't have any wings and it pretty much spends its time just with its head poked out of the case waiting to be mated with and then lays its eggs within the case and unfortunately pretty shortly after expires um, and that species is a really great example why going out looking for the feeding signs um, really helps you understand the biology of a species in a you know in a much more detailed way than waiting for something to turn up in the moth trap would. Um, you can also stare at tree trunks for hours on end. Um, you, you can find all sorts of things. Um, I mean, you might find some overwintering moths there as well, but you can also, at various times of year, the species on the right, Pomeni regiana, I mentioned earlier, larval cocoons can be found beneath flaky pieces of sycamore bark. And that, uh, that's really common. I mean, you, the, the moth does turn up at moth traps, but I don't think anywhere near as commonly as you'll find the early stages, pretty much any sycamore tree. Look under any piece of bark and I always seem to turn up a few cocoons. Um, on the right, something that is probably worth looking for in a couple of months time, an ammonia formosana. Um, the larva feeds under the bark of cherry trees and it forms this reddish brown frass, which comes sort of tumbling out, but it's held in place by, by the silk. Um, if you're able to scrape that away and have a careful look, you should see um, uh, sort of creamy coloured larva within there, and that'll be the larva of this species. There are other species that form similar feeding signs on lime and sallow and apple and oak. Um, more cycads. Um, the what? Oh, so these, yeah, the, these were all from Southern Cemetery, a very famous cemetery. I believe it's the largest in Europe. Um, that's just a mile down the road from us. Immortalized by Morrissey and Cemetery Gates for any Smiths fans. Um, anyway, uh, on the, uh, the the moth and the case to the left of it on the top is Nausea jupicella. 
um, a psychid moth that does have um, a winged adult. Um, so it's got a winged male and female, this one. The one in the middle is a, a species called La Luffia lapidella, um, which is a parthenogenetic species. Um, the larvae of both this and the species above feed on the um, greenish lichens that grow on gravestones, old walls, old trees. Um, and in the case of Luffia lapidella, um, <coughs> sorry, the lichen and other materials are used to form rings around the, um, the cone-shaped case, which make it really quite distinctive. The adults of that is really rarely seen, even less so than um, the Psyche castor, because this species is parthenogenetic, meaning it only has a female. Re reproduction is entirely asexual. Um, and the, the moth that emerges from the cocoon after pupation is that funny little thing there on, in the, on the right hand side in the middle, which, more, which looks more like an overgrown flea than any, any type of moth. Um, and as you can probably see, it's got a huge ovipositor, which it uses to deposit eggs back within the case and the cycle begins again. Um, and then down at the bottom, certainly in, in this in the cemetery where these were found, there's loads of lime trees and um, a very common uh, leaf miner on lime is Buccalatrix thoracella. And the larvae form these cocoons, these sort of ribbed cocoons, and these are really common on the gravestones beneath the lime trees. Um, and to the right of that is, is the moth that would have emerged from one of those. So even feed underwater, if you really want to <laughs> go looking for feed signs, you can grab a net and go down to the nearest pond and you might find some of these. So this species, the brown china mark, the larva cuts pieces out of the pond, various pond weeds and forms a case um, within which it overwinters. Um, so if you see leaves with these ovals cut out, then it can be pretty sure this is the culprit. Um, closely related is the small china mark. Um, you can look for this in ponds, the sort of slow moving streams that are filled with duckweed and the larva forms a case from the duckweed. Um, and yeah, the overwinters within this, it keeps adding to the case as it, as it overwinters and as the larva develops. So probably it's easier to find in a few months time, but it, it will still be there at this time of year. Um, and this actually does feed underwater, it's quite an amazing thing. Um, quite similar really to the sort of caddis fly larva. Uh, and then on the right, bottom right, is the water veneer, a century ephemerella, which is um, a really interesting species. I think you might often see it swarming towards um, a moth trap in the middle of summer. Um, and they, they, all those moths will have come from a, a, a fully aquatic larva that feed up to two meters below the surface. So it's a really common moth, but I must admit, I haven't actually found a larva yet. So that is one that's definitely worth looking for, but you'll need your nets to go and look for that one. I mean, fishing net rather than a butterfly net. So there's loads of others. I mean, as I say, there's about one and a half thousand species of micro moths and each will have their own individual feeding signs. So it's great to sort of think of a moth that you're really interested in, read up about it and target where you're going to find it and that might be taking um, an old bird's nest or the contents of an unused nest box, see what um, species emerge and you'll often get quite a few of the tineered moths. The, what, the photos on the left show um, Monopis uh, levigella. Um, in the middle is the bee moth, the uh, Aphomia sociella which feeds within the nests of wasps and butterflies. And on the right is one that you don't really want to find because it's the common clothes moth, Tineola bicelliella. And if you do find this, then you probably need to get some new carpets. So uh, anyway, rearing them. Well, if you find any of these um, feeding signs and you want to try and have a go at rearing the adults, over winter, it's best to try and mimic the conditions in which the species would normally live. And that means keeping it outside in a sheltered spot in the garden so, you know, if you found it in a, in a catkin, if you found it in leaves, if you found some old leaf mines, if you found it in a stem, stick those in a pot 
um, make sure there's no intruders, nothing that's going to eat it in there. Um, put a bit of soil in as well. Um, put a bit of netting, a pop socket, a stocking on top. Secure elastic bands. Make sure you've made a note of what's in where, because by the time the moth emerges, you might not quite remember which is in which pot. Um, and that's, that's a real shame when that happens. Um, so yeah, keep these outside in a reasonably sheltered spot and try your best to forget about them. Find out when the moths should emerge and then have a look a few weeks before that and just keep an eye on them every day. And hopefully, eventually you'll see a moth appear on the underside of the netting on top. Well, if you really want to know any more, there's a couple of books I could recommend. That's volume one and that's volume two. Um, as it says, there are guides to finding the early stages in Lancashire and Cheshire, but hopefully um, they will be just applicable um, really for any part of the country and certainly including Gloucestershire. Um, other useful books, if you want to learn more about micro moths, are these two. The one on the left, I'd say, is absolutely essential because um, it lists all of the micro moths and tells you for each species when you'll find it. Um, what does it feed on and lots of hints on how to uh, yeah on how to find it and the feeding signs that each individual species makes um it's it is a field guide but it's a field guide without photos other than those on the front um but it's still an absolutely fantastic book um absolute mine of information and for instance if you were to find something on i know on, on rose bay willow herb you can look in the index and it'll list all the species that will that can be found on Rose Bay Willow Herb. So you can work through them all and, and exclude them and hopefully it can leave you with the one that it definitely is. Um, and great websites, I'm sure you know all these. UK Moths, Lippy Forum, fantastic German site and um, with some great early stage photos. British Leaf Miners, really, really useful, obviously for the leaf mining species. And at the bottom is uh, yet another Facebook group. This one's Micro Moth Field Tips. And we've had some um, great content in there, including from Guy, for which very grateful. Um, and uh, yeah, I would really recommend anyone who's interested in this subject to join this group and hopefully you'll see some interesting discussions and um, read about some interesting tips, many of which are not in the book because they're from species that are perhaps more appropriate to your area that actually don't occur in Lancashire and Cheshire, which is fantastic. So I guess that's the end. So I'll stop sharing. And if anyone's got any questions, then fire away.